All right. So again, welcome to the Golden Crown Literary Society's virtual series. As GCLS pursues its mission of supporting women loving women literature throughout the world. The virtual series strives to connect readers and writers, um, feature talented authors and celebrate the diverse communities that are all vital to our stories. We hope they enjoy today's event, March Author Readings Coming Attractions. If at any time you lose connection, we suggest that you leave the event and rejoin. Please take advantage of the chat feature. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the March Authors Reading Coming Attractions. Our people are gonna join us now. And um, our moderator today is Kay Acker. She, Kay grew up in Northern Alabama and lives in Southern Vermont. She and her wife play tabletop games with friends and enjoy the daily antics of two cats. Her first novel, Leaving's Not the Only Way to Go, was released by Bella Books this month. So take it away, Kay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here uh, with these five authors. I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, so uh, Reba Birmingham. Uh, is the author of fun speculative fiction stories, Floodlight and Words on a Plate, books one and two in her Hercinian Forest series. Also, Baby It's Cold for the anthology Love is in the Air, 2018 by Regal Crest. Uh, Birmingham is an award-winning attorney, most notably being honored by being added to the Harvey Milk Wall in her hometown for her work to advance the LGBT community. Uh, K.G. McGregor uh, has always dreamed of becoming an astronaut, uh, but she earned her PhD in journalism and went to work as a political pollster and market researcher. In 2002, she began writing fan fiction for the Xena Warrior Princess fandom and discovered her bliss. Since then, she's authored over two dozen novels, collecting a Lammy and eight Golden Crown Awards. KG is past president of the Board of Trustees of the Lambda Literary Foundation. A native of the uh, North Carolina mountains, she now makes her home in Nashville, Tennessee with her partner Jenny and two raucous felines, Rosie and Agnes. Hi everyone. Um, Rita Potter <laughs> uh, has spent most of her life trying to figure out what makes people tick. Uh, to that end, she holds a bachelor's degree in social work and an MA in sociology. Her favorite pastime is crawling around inside people's brains. Her loved ones are grateful that she now has characters whose minds she can explore, so maybe she'll stay out of theirs. In her spare time, she enjoys the outdoors and she's especially drawn to water. Her first love has always been reading, which has spurred her writing. She rides a Harley Davidson and has an unnatural obsession with fantasy football. She lives in a small town in Illinois with her wife, Tara, and their cat, Chumley, who actually runs the household. I love all the cats here. She is currently a student of the GCLS Writing Academy 2021. Uh, Sherry Reynolds, uh, her newest novel, The Tender Grave, uh, was released this month. She's also the author of the novels Bitterroot Landing, The Rapture of Canaan, which was an Oprah Book Club selection and New York Times bestseller, A Gracious Plenty, Firefly Cloak, The Sweet In Between, The Homespun wi Wisdom of Myrtle Teak Rib, and a play, Aurabelle's Orabel Wheelbarrow. Sherry teaches creative writing and literature at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where she currently serves as department chair of English. She lives in the town of Cape Charles on Virginia's Eastern shore. And Nance Spark. A vivid imagination spurred her desire to write lesbian romance. Nance lives in South Central Wisconsin with her spouse. Her passion for photography, homesteading, hiking, gardening, and most anything outdoors comes through her in her stories. When the sun is out and the sky is blue, especially during the golden hour, Nance can be found on the Wisconsin River with a camera in hand, capturing shots of large birds in flight. Uh, so uh, here's our panel and we're going to jump right into the readings uh, and feel free to post questions in the chat or the Q&A feature. We'll get to those once everyone has had a chance to read. 
So if everyone else uh, doesn't mind turning off their cameras, uh, then Reba, you have the floor. Thank you, Kay, GCLS, and Bella Books. Today I'm reading from book three of the Hercinian Forest series, which is The Wolf You Feed. It is not actual size. It is not out yet. It will be out soon. This is a scene involving Haloisa, guardian of the keep. We meet her briefly in book one, Floodlight, and like all the many characters, she weaves in and out as the main story develops. Today, uh, this scene has a bit of humor, and Aaron, leader of the free creatures, has been transformed from a griffin to a human man, and he and Haloisa must go to California, where his daughter Mitzi lives. Shrum ran to tell an unhappy Haloisa Aaron needed her to leave with him. He ran a short distance across the keep to the soldier's barracks and skidded to a stop. Taking a deep breath, he knocked on the warrior's door. Shrum knew Haloisa had been unable to tell Lily, her mate, she was leaving for the United States. It was difficult to send a message because Lily served undercover in Schwarzwald Castle, the enemy camp. This helped him to understand her mood, but didn't change the fact that Haloisa's response to being told what to do was typically either anger or violence. Come, an annoyed female voice called out. Haloisa, in a rough quarter she shared with the troops, stood in the middle of the room. She wore only undergarments and anyone could see from her muscled body she was a battle-scarred athlete. Her hair was wild. And even in bra and panties, Haloisa appeared every inch the guardian of the keep. If she didn't scare him so much, Shrum would have laughed as she tossed a frilly gown to the floor in a fit of pique. A leather suitcase lay open on a rather spartan bed and it had nothing in it but a helmet. Aloysia's nostrils flared, her chest heaved, a fierce frown on her face. Shrum could see things were at a breaking point. Two dressing maidens were making suggestions. The first dresser, Goethe, an older woman, enjoyed a reputation as the garden's most prolific seamstress. All right, Heloisa, you don't want to wear a dress. I can alter. Will not wear a dress, will not wear a skirt, or any silly thing you have unless it's for battle. I need to fight. The second dresser bit her lip. How about leather pants? Those are stylish and can be used to protect your skin in battle. The first woman barked out, leather pants, and what'll she wear for a blouse? Aloysia addressed Shrum. What is it, Shrum? His excellency is ready to go, most great warrior, and requests you meet him now. The two dressers chatted rapidly, talking over each other. No time, and, and surely we can't. Aloysia shouted them down. Get me the leather pants and boots. I have some simple white tunics to wear. It will have to do. We're flying something called commercial. Aaron Hart and Haloisa sat in Economy Plus. It had been hell getting her weapons on board the plane. After setting off the metal detectors several times, they finally decided that Haloisa's dagger, sword, and specialty arrows would have to travel in a checked bag. The warrior, though in civilian clothing, still managed to look intimidating. Don't these people protect themselves? Not even a knife on the plane? Haloisa, it's been a unicorn's age since I traveled to this other world, but no. Most people don't carry weapons. These are some of the most violent people in the world, always shooting. A flight attendant in blue leaned in with a smile. Are you two okay? Aloysia answered, yes. Can I have a drink? The woman, probably wanting to head off trouble, said, the cart's coming later, but I can bring you something now. We have soft drinks. Aloysia barked out, I want mead. Aaron glared at her. With barely a falter in her smile, the woman said, we don't have mead, so how about a soft drink, coffee, alcoholic beverage? Aaron Hart jumped in. Two waters, please. He gave the attendant a toothy smile. Who are you? Haloisa, Haloisa turned her face toward the window and pouted. Aaron cleared his throat. Haloisa, you need to settle down. I'm sure you'll get a chance to use your special skills at some point, but realize this is not the Hersenian forest. And he noted passengers staring as they struggled down the aisle with luggage. Put your legs together. It's the way of women here. 
the formidable woman harumphed and put her booted feet in a more ladylike pose. By the goddesses Aphenea and their descendants, I don't know how much I can stand. Lily doesn't even know we left. You rushed me so much I couldn't send a message. Aloysia turned her broad face to the window again and watched baggage handlers on the tarmac. Aaron stretched out his legs as they were in the emergency row, still getting used to having them. After two waters were delivered, he sighed. Lily's smart. She'll be fine. Aaron took a sip then said, Aloysia, there are social rules here. Women are um, more revered if they look and act a certain way, he stretched. And you might want to work on using the local language. I know you know it. He gave her a side glance. Aloysia could be such a pill. She turned her braided head to Aaron. What witchery we must indulge in. Words are used like swords here. It isn't honest. Try for me, for the garden. He sipped his water. A Lufthansa flight attendant with a badge that said Heidi appeared before the row. Hello, you are all seated in an exit row. Are each of you familiar with the exit row responsibilities as depicted on the front of the safety information card? I need a verbal yes from each of you. It took Aaron and everyone by surprise when Haloisa left from her seat, knelt in front of the startled woman and bowed her head, hand over heart. No worries, my lady. I shall faithfully execute my responsibility to care for these people. She glanced impishly at Aaron for the garden. In German, a smile tugging at her lips, the woman said quietly, you don't need to kneel. Several passengers giggled and Aaron did a face palm. That's delightful, thank you. Um, so uh, one question uh, before we go forward, uh, you described your series as uh, being about good versus evil, uh, particularly this book, The Wolf You Feed, and your villains are pretty clear allegories for specific problems. So what makes fantasy such a good vehicle for discussing those themes? Great question, Kay. I like fantasy because um, there's much truth to be found in fiction and in poetry, and um, you get to make up the world. So you're not limited by um, statistics and news reporting. So the characters are living their lives, they face evil, sometimes what I call the big E evil, which you know I get to make cartoonish villains, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's speculative fiction. And there are other evils though that are almost more fun to me, um, such as homophobic ladies that run local uh, horticultural society in Maryville or just even the mean girls, you know? So through the adventures, we just get to watch the characters grow and, and alliances shift and sometimes good people become bad and uh, bad people find that there's good in them. So I just love playing with that. Thank you. Thank you. It is a, it seems like a really vivid world that you have to play with those, uh, those themes and the complexity of it. So thank I have, you. I have a rich inner life <laughs> as we all do as writers, I'm sure. Good. Um, so thank you, Reba. And now let's hear from KG McGregor. Hi there. Um, I'm going to be reading today from Words Unsaid. It's book five in the Shaken series. I'm really excited about this book. I didn't honestly intend to write number five in this series, but I came up with this story idea. And as I conceptualized what sort of characters would be appropriate for this story, I realized that, you know, anytime you're going, going to put your characters through the ringer, um, it's important that your readers care about them first because you want, you want your readers rooting for them. And it just occurred to me that, that the Cackless family from the Shaken series was the perfect vehicle to tell the story because my readers already care about them. They, they know all of the characters and, um, and I'm sure they'll be rooting for them. So let me give you a little update. It's been 10 years since book four. That was Mother Load. Um, that was the last installment in this series. 10 years later now, Anna still has her BMW dealerships. 
Lily, I have a Lily in my book too. Um, Lily is now a family court judge. The twins are 10 years old and their oldest son, Andy, is 16 and he's trying their patience. And that's, that's a lot of the subject of this book is uh, some growing pains with, with parenting and uh, Andy in those tween years trying to, trying to be mature enough to be an adult and still wrestling with being a kid. So this excerpt is from chapter four. Lily slammed drawers and stalked around the bedroom while getting ready for bed. Parenting was hard enough without one of them undermining the other. Anna entered the room and closed the door. Georgie and Eleanor are tucked in. I said goodnight to Andy through his door, but he didn't answer. I'm not surprised, Lily said. I doubt he'll speak to either of us in the near future. That's up to him, Anna said. Anna, we agreed. He couldn't drive for a month, but then you told him he couldn't drive till next summer. That's forever to a kid. Yeah, well, it would have been a month if he hadn't sat there and lied to our faces and not one word of apology either. In my book, that's a non-starter. Lily followed her into the bathroom and pointedly said, your book, that's the problem right there. It's supposed to be our book. If you changed your mind, you should have run it by me first. Instead, you issued your edict from on high, and that was that. My edict from on high. That's nice. Tell me how you really feel. Lily replied, how I feel is disrespected. It happens I had a different opinion, which I would have shared if you bothered to ask. You're such a drama queen, Anna said flippantly as she slipped into her pajamas. He should have owned up to it and shown a little remorse. The fact that he didn't do either obviously means he deserved a tougher, tougher punishment. Lily grunted, do you not hear how arrogant that sounds? As long as it's obvious to you, who cares what other people think? Did it occur to you that I literally make decisions like this for a living? I have the power to be a hard-ass bitch. I can slap fines on people and send them to jail for looking at me sideways. But that's not who I am. I look for the path that gets people where they need to be. We could have done that with Andy if you hadn't dropped the hammer on him. Great, so I'm a lousy mother too. Anything else on your checklist? Lily was surprised by the intensity of their bickering, but it really bothered her that Anna had ignored her opinion. Still fuming, she climbed into bed and rolled over to face the wall. Anna was just as indignant. Upon coming to bed, she turned out the light without even a good night. Lily rolled onto her back and tried to calm her emotions. This wasn't the way they treated each other. This tension crackling as they lay side by side not speaking, not touching. Somehow they always found their way to a peaceful stasis before sleep, whether by resolution or truce. One of them would have to breach the divide, an apology, a concession. She was choosing her conciliatory words when Anna's cool finger brushed hers beneath the blanket, a pinky deliberately teasing hers until they hooked. Lily answered by rolling into Anna's arms. I'm sorry, babe, Anna said softly. I should have talked to you first. And I'm sorry I was so self-righteous. Turns out being a judge gives you a God complex. Anna kissed her forehead and climbed out of bed. Where are you going? To tell Andy we'll talk it over again tomorrow when we've all calmed down. That's the end. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, so you said that this is uh, book five in a series uh, that you hadn't added to for a while. And uh, you considered different ways to approach this story and decided that connecting with your audience uh, through these characters they already know was the best approach for this story, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the other differences between writing for a series versus writing a standalone? 
Well, obviously there's, um, in a series, you, you skim over who the characters are. You remind the readers who've read the other books and you give new readers enough information that they can enjoy a book that's a, a standalone book um, without having to know all the backstory. But, um, but I think the main difference in writing this series for me is that most of the other works that I do are romances or the romantic intrigue and you're introducing a, a pair of characters and you're uh, having them make a connection and they, they develop feelings for each other, but there's an obstacle keeping them apart. You overcome that obstacle and send them on their way on their happy ever after. But when you're writing a sequel, that story's been done already. And the only way you can write a romance as a sequel is to break them up. And then you have to overcome those obstacles again to put them back together and set them off on a happy ever after. And I actually did that in book two. The, the characters hit a really rough patch and came apart. So that, um, that book, Aftershock, was also a romance. But the books after that were a totally different plot. And so the difference, the main difference is that you're not writing for a certain beat, you're not following a romance formula, you're following uh, another dramatic formula where you have, um, you can have romantic scenes, but the arc itself is some other plot. It's either a, a mystery or a, a you know, a, like a, if you're writing a detective series, it's a new murder. In this case, um, the Shaken series is a family saga. So it's new stories that develop, um, that look into the family. So it's a, a post-romance novel. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. A, a, dur a during romance novel. I mean, yes. it's, I, romances I, I, don't end. They, they never end. It's a, a wonderful view into how romance lasts as well. Yeah, that's that's been fun. And, and, um, and some people may be uncomfortable hearing Anne and Lily bickering because this is not, this is not something they commonly do. But you know, challenges, challenges of parenting can change people. Absolutely. But they're still in love. I, I think that came through really clearly. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, one of our debut authors. Uh, so everyone get extra excited, please, uh, for uh, Rita Potter. Yeah, I have my debut novel. I don't have a cover. So this is what it looks like. Um, I hopefully will have my book soon. It comes out on April 15th and it's called Broken Not Shattered and it's being published by Sapphire Books. Um, I don't think my scene needs much introduction, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start writing and, or writing, reading, and let you figure out what's going on. Jill knew Alex was doing everything in her power not to lose her cool. Alex ever, had every right to tell her to get the hell out, but Jill knew she wouldn't. Don't you think we need to talk about this? Not today, Alex. I fail to understand why you would go back. It's complicated. Jill delivered her usual line. She knew the answer was like nails on chalkboard to Alex. Alex's face reddened. She stood and piled her dirty dishes on a tray. Well, I guess that's the end of the conversation then, isn't it? Alex picked up the tray and started towards the kitchen. Alex, don't walk away from me. Alex turned, the frustration evident on her face. What do you want from me? I want you to understand. How the hell can I understand when you won't explain anything to me? The vein in Alex's neck throbbed. You're not being fair. Can't you just believe in me? Wow, I cannot believe you just said that to me. This conversation's over. Alex turned to leave the room. Alex, please come back. I can't deal with you being upset with me. Alex stopped with her back towards Jill. Her shoulders rose and fell several times before she turned and set the tray back on the table. She sat down on the couch across from Jill. Several seconds passed before she speak. What do you want from me? 
what would you like me to say? Tell me what you're feeling. Do you really want to know? Of course I do. Alex paused and looked at Jill, but she couldn't maintain eye contact. Instead, her eyes dropped to the floor. Okay, I'll tell you. I've never felt so helpless in my entire life. You know, may never understand how painful it is for me to see you all beaten up like that and not be able to do anything. Then I feel guilty because you've lived with this all these years and I've only known for a month and it's ripping me apart. There are days I think I'm going to break and then I get pissed off at myself because I should be strong for you. And I try, I try so damn hard to do whatever I can do to make your life better. Then I see I'm not because you're gonna go back to him again. Jill opened her mouth to speak. Alex was still staring at the floor so she didn't notice and continued. The images they play over and over in my head. I close my eyes at night and I see you slammed against the wall. I shut my eyes in the shower and I see you laying in a bloody heap on the floor. I don't even want to tell you the other things I see. And that movie plays in this endless loop in my head, scene after scene of you being hurt. And all I can do is stand there and watch. Last night was the first night in a month that I slept well because I knew you were safe because you were here with me. Alex dropped her head into her hand and rested her forehead against her palm. The anguish in her voice left no doubt how she was feeling. I look at you now and my heart breaks. I wanna wrap you in my arms and never let you leave, but I know I can't. I have to let you walk out that fucking door knowing this will happen to you again. And maybe one day you won't be so damn lucky and you won't get up and come to me because you can't. And I'll call and I'll call and you won't answer and you'll never call me back. And several days later, I'll find out you're gone that you died alone in the dark, frightened and cold. And I'll know that your last moments were filled with pain. And I wasn't there to offer you any comfort. No one will be. And for the rest of my life, I'll have to live, live with the knowledge that I failed you, that I let you walk out of here and I didn't do anything. And I, Alex tried to continue, but her voice cracked. Jill stared in stunned silence. Alex, the one who'd been her rock, sat across from her broken. Silently, Alex cried, the tears wetting the front of her shirt. Until now, Jill hadn't understood the depths of the agony she was putting Alex through. I'm so sorry, Alex. I knew it was hard for you, but I never realized just how hard. I've been so selfish. No, no, Jill, it's me that's being selfish. You're just focused on surviving. Alex, this has to end. Please, no, Jill, don't walk away from me again. Jill looked at Alex confused, then comprehension dawned. No, that's not what I'm on, Alex. It's time I tell you the entire truth. Whew. Might take a second to catch your breath after that. <laughs> that was that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and so this is a a romance about uh, someone who is in an abusive relationship, which is a very heavy topic. Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, the book you're working on now is a dystopian novel. Uh, so you're you're clearly invested in in these heavy topics, but you approach it with an optimistic point of view. I mean, this is a romance. And uh, as someone who wrote a romance novel about uh, a bereavement group, I, I know that can be sort of hard to pull off. So what was the process for balancing the, the hurt and the hope in this story? Great question, Kay. And you're probably going to think I'm crazy. Um, I didn't realize I, I, I wrote heavy, dark stuff um, until recently. Um, one of my friends from the Writing Academy is like, dude, your stuff is so heavy. How, how do you do such heavy stuff? Why don't you write something fun and happy and goofy and that makes people feel good? And Anybody that knows me knows like I'm like one of the biggest optimists ever. So when I look at my stories, I don't even see the darkness. I don't even see the heaviness because, you know, my favorite people in the whole world are the people that walk through fire and come out the other end. You know, I don't like things being easy because I believe so much in, in, in people and resilience and that we have a choice to make our, our lives better. So um, one of my favorite quotes from the Writing Academy is 
the writer's job is to put your characters up in a tree and throw rocks at them. And for me, I don't just throw rocks. I throw missiles. I hit throw hand grenades because I want my characters really to earn their happiness. And, and I believe so much that no matter what happens in anybody's life, they can reach that happiness. So I guess it's just natural for me that there's always going to be a way out of no matter what you're having, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's an apocalypse, that there's something that to be grateful for. There's something to be hopeful for. So it's just a natural thing for me because I do have that personality. So I guess I don't even realize I write dark stuff until recently. So I know that's a crazy answer, but that's my answer. Well, it's, uh, I guess, when you know that everything is headed toward the light, it's not as dark. Right, exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, uh, let's hear from Sherry Reynolds. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And um, I really enjoyed, I've, I've enjoyed these readings so far so much and I'm excited for you Rita that's really it's such a great feeling um the debut novel so congratulations on that this is my novel it's called The Tender Grave and this is my it's actually my seventh novel but I haven't brought out a novel in almost 10 years and so um so it's it sort of feels like starting over and this book is published by Bywater Books and I'm having an amazing experience there so far I'm so grateful um, for all the help I've had there uh, I live in Cape Charles Virginia with my partner Barbara and our dog Easy Peasy and three cats I don't want to leave out my cats because everybody's been talking about their cats so we have um Kalinda Cole and Nicodemus. I don't know if anybody will show up during my reading, but um, but they're here somewhere. And so my new novel is set here on the eastern shore of Virginia, and the book follows really two stories, two sisters. Um, the first is Dory, and Dory is 17, and she's committed a hate crime against a gay boy at her school. And with her mom's help, Dory's run away to find the older half-sister from her mom's previous marriage. That sister is the second main character, and that's Teresa. So Teresa is a lesbian. She's married to Jen, and Teresa and Jen are in the process of trying to get pregnant. They've done six inseminations that have not worked, and they are just about to try again when Dory shows up out of the blue, and they have no idea what Dory's done. And so the section I'm going to read to you begins on the very first day when Dory's just arrived. They've gone to the pub for dinner, and Dory has told them that her mom kicked her out, and that, that in recent years, her mom's been in and out of psychiatric hospitals and that she's been in and out of foster care. So here we go. In all the years she'd been out of touch with her mother, Teresa hadn't let herself think about things like psychiatric hospitals or foster care. From her earliest memories, her parents fought, usually because of her mom's antics, like the time she took Teresa to sit on the roof during a thunderstorm, rain pelting down, smoky clouds shrouding the sky until lightning flashed through. Teresa and her mom had clapped and cheered for every lightning strike until her dad got home and found them there. Get in this house, he demanded, but her mom refused. Finally, he climbed up to the roof himself, took Teresa beneath his arm, and carefully guided her down the slippery ladder and back inside. Until she was older, she didn't understand that all mothers didn't throw oranges from the fruit bowl when they got frustrated or rush out of the house sobbing and disappear into the woods for hours at a time. And other mothers certainly didn't get hurt as often. The hospital emergency room formed the backdrop for so many of Teresa's earliest recollections as her mom was prone to stepping on nails or tripping over extension cords and splitting open her head. It took a while for Teresa to notice that most of her mom's accidents happened whenever she or her dad had other things planned. When she was in the finals for the regional spelling bee, her mom had an attack of pancreatitis and both parents missed hearing her spell malevolent and schism, though she got kicked out anyway on parliament. What did it mean that she could still remember, still held on to those words? And then when she was in 11th grade, her mom had run off with the Baptist preacher, a married man no less, leaving Teresa and her father to face that blistering scandal. 
She dropped out of college the semester her father died, but went back the next. Some semesters she could only take a couple of classes. Some semesters she took six at once. When she graduated with a degree in secondary education, she sent out an announcement to her mom's last known address. Teresa found a job teaching history two states away and moved from her hometown and all those complicated losses, but she did her best to keep in touch. She even tried to visit once after her mom called from a payphone crying. Teresa got a last minute substitute to fill in at school and drove 200 miles to a diner where they'd arranged to meet, but her mom stood her up. Later in a letter, she said that it was just bad timing and that she'd finally gotten off those terrible pills as if Teresa had known she was on pills and now her psychiatric medications could finally do their work. Sometimes there'd be months of silence. Then just when Teresa would think she must have died, she'd receive a note and that one time the birth announcement for Dorothy Ann, no letter attached, only a rural route box number for a return address. It blew her mind that her unstable mother would bring another child into the world. Her mom was over 40 by then. Teresa herself was old enough to be a mother, but she had better sense. She bought that baby a sweater and mailed it, hoping it would be big enough. And that was the last thing she sent until she invited her mom to their commitment ceremony and reception. It was a risky thing to do. Teresa often wondered if her mom had suspected she was gay. She'd been a tomboy, more interested in playing in the creep than playing dress up, but that was no good indicator. And her mom had run off with the preacher long before Teresa began to date. Even after she started seeing women, there was no occasion to come out to her mom. And anyway, she didn't need another reason to be rejected. Then Jen came along. With Jen, she fell in love and all the cliches about love seemed true. She was over the moon, brought to her knees. Silly as it seemed, she wanted her mom to share her happiness, as unlikely as it seemed, she wanted her blessings. At the very least, she decided she should give her mom a chance to know and love Jen. What did she have to lose? She anguished over the letter she included in the envelope with the invitation to their commitment ceremony. She could still remember how her belly cramped as she waited in line at the post office to be sure she'd included enough postage, but all that anxiety was wasted. There was never a reply. She can't help it, Jen tried to console. If she's as evangelical as you claim, she probably can't say anything without condemning your lifestyle. You know the old saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all and her mom didn't. Over the years, Teresa's hurt and anger dissolved into numbness. And when same-sex marriage became legal in Virginia and she and Jen tied the knot again, it didn't even occur to her to share the news. In fact, her mother's absence became no more noticeable than a pepper shaker missing from the table. Most of the time it made no difference, though every now and then a little more spice would have improved on an already fine recipe. By the time Dory arrived at her door, Teresa had seriously believed that she was over her mother, but there in the pub with Jen and Dory, she could hardly swallow her fish and chips for the guilt. Maybe there'd been a reply lost in the mail, or maybe her mom had never received her letter and invitation. She might have moved to a different address by then. Why hadn't Teresa given her the benefit of the doubt? And how could she ever expect to be a good mother if she hadn't even been a good daughter and sister? She'd given in way too easy. With the internet, she could have found her mom. If they'd been in touch, she and Jen could have provided a home for Dory. No wonder Teresa hadn't been able to get pregnant. She had to work a lot harder to connect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, some really heavy topics here and also a discussion of, uh, of parenthood. Uh, so how did you choose uh, to write about these topics and what are you hoping that uh, readers will take away from this story? Well, you know, I didn't actually start out with the idea to write about this topic. I, the, the, the hate crime was the bigger, um, the, you know, the, the bigger drama in the story. And when I was thinking about, well, where would this, this child, this 17 year old who's committed this hate crime, where would she go? And then, you know, I'm like, okay, she's gonna go to an older sibling. And then obviously it makes 
um, it adds to the drama for that sister to be gay, right? So she's she's committed this crime against a gay boy and now she's going and she's gotta be, she's horrified. And then it also, um, you know, it creates this complication because Teresa and Jen, um, they're connected as a couple, but they are not clear about having a baby and what it means. And so Jen has always been, for years, has been saying, we need to have a baby and I wanna have a baby. And Teresa wants to have a baby, but Teresa's scared to death because she didn't have the greatest childhood. She's afraid of her mom. She doesn't know. Um, she's afraid of the world that she's living in. She's afraid of um, that the, they'll need to move if they um, if they have a baby in the area that they live in. That her kid may be bullied. And so by having this person that they learn out you know later has been a bully and has committed this crime um, as her sibling, she has to confront the idea that what she wants is a beautiful, happy idealized idea of a child, but not the child she could have had all along. And so you kind of get into themes there also about parenting and about, you know, she could have been parenting Dory, but she wasn't there for Dory. And now what if she has a baby and it turns out to be a kid like Dory, or what if it turns out to be a kid like the one that Dory has attacked? And so it gets into some really um, difficult tensions there. So uh a lot of need to communicate about these expectations. Right, right. And creates tension between these two characters as well. I mean, the, the, between the, between these married women as well as having this other tension. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sure. All right, and our last reader for today, our, uh, our second debut author, uh, Nance Sparks. Hello, everybody. I'm Nan Sparks, and I'll be reading from my debut novel, Cowgirl. Let's hold up the cover for you. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my characters. Erin Jacobs trusts no one, reeling from a devastating altercation with her foster family that's left her scarred inside and out. She's all too happy to isolate herself from the world, especially the rumors floating around town that accuse her of murder. Carol Matthews has just finished college, and she's spending some time with her aunt and uncle before she decides where life will take her. And that is until her world's turned upside down. This passage I'm about to read to you is the moment that these two women meet for the first time. Chapter four. Carol inhaled deeply. Two of her favorite scents teased her nose, campfire and coffee. She'd left her aunt and uncle's house about an hour earlier, craving an after dinner walk to help digest the heavily fried meal. She inhaled again, turning her head to find the source. She looked left and right, but saw nothing. Then just as she stepped past the dark shadowy, shadowy farmhouse on her left, she caught sight of an orange flicker off in the distance. Carol stopped mid stride in the center of the road. A silhouetted figure sat next to the campfire talking to someone that Carol couldn't see. She waited for a reply and yet heard nothing. Carol squinted trying to find the second person. She caught movement closer to the fire. What was that, a dog? Was that laughter she heard? There's a dark cloud hanging over that farm. Death haunts that land. Carol could hear her aunt's voice in her head. She hadn't been able to shake the conversation with her aunt about this farm or its owner. Consumed with curiosity, she ducked between the strands of barbed wire that, and made her way towards the firelight. She'd covered about half the distance when the silhouetted figure spun around. Who's out there? Make yourself known or I'll release the dog. Carol froze in her tracks. She squeezed her eyes shut, chastising herself for trespassing on this woman's property. What had she been thinking? She allowed her breath to escape and then drew in another before trusting her voice. My name is Carol Matthews. I'm here visiting my aunt who lives just across the way. I saw the fire while I was out walking and thought I'd say hello. Would you come up here to the firelight, Carol Matthews? I'd like to see who I'm talking to. Carol's heart was pounding in her chest with such force she felt deafened by it. She put one foot in front of the other, cautiously making her way towards the stranger next to the fire. She looked around, taking in how large the shepherd type dog was, especially given that it was baring its teeth and growling at her. She felt every bit the fool for coming here. She froze, her breath catching, when the woman suddenly snapped her fingers and made a hand signal to the dog. Great, she'd be mauled, and no one would know where she was. Instinctively, her eyes squeezed shut, though they, she forced them to reopen when nothing happened. There was no movement, no dog lunging for her throat, nothing at all. Carol allowed the trap air to escape when she saw the dog simply eating from a bowl on the ground. The woman smiled at Carol, half of her face hidden in the shadows, half lit by the firelight. Hi, Carol. My name is Erin Jacobs. This is my dog, Bailey. Erin extended a hand in greeting. 
Carol took a step forward, closing the distance needed to shake Aaron's hand. She instinctively noticed by touch more than sight how rough and calloused her hands were. We're just sitting down to dinner. Would you like anything? Aaron motioned towards a plate of food. Oh, I've already eaten. Thank you. I should go and allow you to eat in peace. Ah, sit if you like. Enjoy the fire. You're welcome to this chair if you prefer it over a log. I'm sorry I only have the one out. I don't get many visitors. Please don't give up your chair. A log is fine. I don't want to be any trouble. Well, then the log is yours. Would you like a cup of coffee? Carol inhaled. She had to admit the coffee smelled wonderful. I'd love a cup, but I'd only accept it after you finished your meal. Please eat. It was rude of me to intrude. Fair enough. So you're visiting your aunt and uncle? Erin picked up a fork. She scooped up a few potato pieces onto the tines before popping them into her mouth. Carol turned her attention to the flames dancing in the fire pit. She heard a pop of hot sap trapped in a log and then enjoyed the release of sparks as they floated up in the air. Suddenly she realized she'd been asked a question. Sorry, yes, visiting. I arrived a couple days ago. Erin nodded, chewing on another bite of her meal. She sat down her fork. The coffee's done. Why don't I get you a cup so I don't feel like I'm eating in front of you? The cups are just upstairs. It'd only take a second. Well, the coffee does smell good, Carol smiled. Erin looked at herself from the chair. She was much taller than Carol had expected. She seemed so nice, much too nice to be a murderer. The fire cracked and popped again, pulling Carol's attention back to floating orange embers. Do you take anything in it? Erin turned to ask. Yes, both cream and sugar. If it's no trouble, thank you. Carol answered before she looked up. When their eyes met, Carol's breath caught in her throat. Aaron's face was now completely lit by firelight. Deep scars surrounded Aaron's left eye, and the eye itself didn't look quite right either, though it was difficult to distinguish why in the dim light. Carol did her best to control her breathing and stifle her shock. Aaron nodded and turned back towards the barn. The large dog Bailey was right at her side, her back now illuminated by the firelight. Carol was working hard to gather her composure when she caught sight of a large wood-handled knife secured in Aaron's belt carries a knife around. Carol's heart pounded. What if she stabbed her mama right in the neck? Carol heard her aunt's voice in her head again. She remained statue still, waiting for Aaron to disappear into the barn before she bolted back to the fence line. She tripped on something in the grass and fell to her knees. She blinked a couple of times so that her eyes could adjust to the darkness and then shot for the barbed wire fence. Carol ran all the way back to the safety of her aunt's house. The end. Uh, so uh, not a love at first sight in this one. Uh, a little intense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I I agree with uh, Elaine Mattern in the, the comments. I want to hear more. Uh, <laughs> and so how did you decide to, to start the relationship in that moment? And were you surprised by how this relationship developed? Well, it's funny because as I come up with these characters, and I look at their personalities and who they are and their backstories, you kind of have to figure out what rut they're in and what they need to break free from. And that's kind of how all of this comes to life is uh, these characters kind of just take on a life of their own and start telling their own story. And uh, this is a, a story again with some pretty heavy uh, topics involved, is it not? Yeah, there's um, uh, Aaron's a foster child. Um, her, she's had a rough, rough childhood, obviously, to be end up in foster care, and then continues a uh, challenging life when she has uh, altercations with her foster family themselves, and then just kind of shuts down and pushes everybody out of her life. So, it's uh, Carol comes into her life just to kind of pull her back into humanity. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't ask if she did it or not. I'm sure that's a it's a who done it. But uh, yeah, uh, so everyone, if you'd like to turn on your cameras and join us, and folks, please put uh, any questions in the chat. Um, as folks are typing, I'll uh, throw out a question that I want to know. Uh, if you guys could tell us a bit more about uh, your inspiration and maybe what's the the oddest place that you've found inspiration for your writing. I'll pop in real quick. Um, myths and fairy tales. So growing up, 
uh, love to get the backstory and, and how those developed in the areas they came from. That's it. I, I always start out with a, a what if. So for, for this book, it was, you know, what if a friend of mine was in a situation like this? How would I feel? And I took it one step further. What if I fell in love with somebody who was in the situation? What would be the feeling? So I always start all my stories in what ifs. I think of um, sometimes a story is inspired by a character. And when I start to think about a character and start listening to her voice and imagining her backstory, then I want to see that character fall in love and I'll um, write that story around it. But other times I, I want to write about something that interests me and, and I imagine a romance in that in and around that topic so you can pick up the newspaper and come away with an idea for a story i do things more in scenes i tend to see a scene or something happen even if i don't hear anybody's words i'll see the scene and create a story in my mind will just start spinning so I use the same sorts of things too. I, um, I, I usually start with a character, but a lot of times it's connected to a what if as well um, in terms of, um, you know, I, I will, or I'll see some action that somebody does and think why, or how did they get to this place or what would have provoked this and just start backing up. Occasionally I get great images from dreams too. So I like the fairy, the, the myth fairy tale piece too. I think I am inspired and I think, I think that that's an inspiration, but in terms of my own work, a lot of times it's uh, some sort of an image that strikes me. Uh, so first question that came through the chat uh, is for uh, Reba. Uh, you have so many strong women in your book. Are they based on women you know in real life? Um, pieces of them are. I think it's probably for everybody, it's really rare that you have a character that is a person in your day-to-day -day life. But um, I'm married to a really strong, powerful you know, lesbian attorney. I have, I'm surrounded by everyone. Um, you know, I know artists and I know uh, home health care nurses and mothers um, dealing with teenagers. You know, that was, you know, they're just everyday heroes all over the place and lots and lots of strong women. There's no shortage of them. So why aren't they more reflected in literature? So... And it's so wonderful to, to take those women and put them into a fantasy setting where they can be even bigger than life. Yes, and, and sprout rings from time to time and, and other magical things. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next question uh, is for Nance. Uh, uh, have you thought of writing mystery? Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. So I don't, I don't know that I've thought about that specifically, but it's certainly fun to weave all sorts of different things into the storyline. So mystery, um, action, different adventures. So that's anything's so, possible. <laughs> so we're likely to see more uh, intrigue in yes. your other books. The next one that's coming out after Cowgirl is uh, much lighter and um, just a light contemporary romance, but the one that's on my next horizon is a little more intense and perhaps on the side of mystery. So anything is certainly possible. I love the variety. Excellent. Thank you. Um, got another question for everyone. Uh, what's been your biggest challenge as a writer? I'd say time. Um, having, having a job and, and trying to write is probably just having the time to do it because I have like 8,000 stories in my head and it's just having the time to get them onto paper, so to speak. So time would be my answer. I'll add that I, I, 
I sometimes feel like I don't know that anybody needs to hear what I have to say. Um, it's not that, I mean, I have plenty to say. I said a lot too. So, I mean, it's not like there's a shortage of it. I've said my piece in some ways, but I took a, I've had a big break from my writing. And a big part of that has been just feeling like I've said enough and I kind of thought I was done. And then I clearly wasn't. I just, I, I, wrote again and I, or I published again. It's hard. one of the things that's a little bit tricky for me is that um, I love to write and I do um, love to tell stories, but I have a hard time being public in the world. That's a, uh, that's a tricky piece for me to, um, to do the work after the book is finished. Like y'all are great. You, this is fun. I'm enjoying this afternoon, but just in a general sort of a way, it's, it's hard for me to be public. And that's a, a that some seems separate from my writing life, but something that I have to deal with. I'd say if you're talking about challenges with writing, um, probably the most difficult thing that I run into is learning enough to put together a great story because we're all, you know, you're developing your craft all along and just making sure that you're dotting all the I's and T's and creating the arcs and the plot lines. You know, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge I run into. When I first started writing, I was writing in the fan fiction community and there were no guardrails at all. And it was, it was like there was a faucet in my brain and it was wide open and I was writing like crazy. The first two years that I wrote fan fiction, I wrote seven novel length stories. But now I edit as I write and I can sit in front of a screen and write you know, I can sit there for a whole day and write a paragraph and delete it. And that's because the more you learn, the more you self-edit. And that's extremely challenging for the creative part of you because you've got this great idea and you want to get it down, but you but you're not satisfied with the way you just said that. And before you can move on and say something else, you've got to go back and tweak those words and make sure those are the exact words you want to use. And it's paralyzing. And I find that extremely challenging. And, and the more I write, the longer my books take. Do you want to add? Uh, do I want to add? Um, no, I'm just listening to everybody. Um, I did see a question for Sherry that I want to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've, we've got um, a couple of, of questions that are connected uh, to this topic of challenges. Uh, and then, yes, got an excellent question for Sherry that we'll get to. Uh, so first is uh, connected to the question of time. How long did your current book take to write? Okay, um, interesting. We had a pandemic in the middle. It, I started it, uh, I, I'm always writing the next book. In fact, I've got book four, you know, I'm well into that one already and they, they don't come out fast enough uh, for my liking, but the reality is like uh, KG was talking, you know, editing, the more I learn and the books get better, um, you're stunned when your editor points out, um, you might want to count your wuzzes or your look, or let's do a word search for, uh, I forget what it was I overused this last time, but um, yeah, so, you know, I have a lot to learn as well. And that's what takes the longest, I think, is the editing. The book's like done. I know the story. Yay, here they are. But um, yeah, so, so it's not really under my control. And that's a good thing. Excellent. Uh, anyone else want to comment how long it took to write the, their most recent book? My most recent one um, took about six months, but this first one took even longer than that, just mm -hmm. trying to get through all of the process. And it, 
you know, you write the book and it's exactly like Reba said, you write the book and you have the idea and then the editor gets a hold of it and you're like, oh, I used Rockstar way too many times or, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. But it's it's a, all such a neat process to have so many fingers touch a book and see how it grows and evolves from concept, idea, rough draft to published work. So that's pretty incredible. My my latest one took eight months, and that was um, that was actually pretty good for me. Mm. And was that from from the beginning of the draft to the completed product, or just that was that was from the conception to the to delivering the final? But you know, we had a pandemic, and sitting at home on my butt all day. I I take a break from writing by ordering groceries. <laughs> I worked on my last one for probably off and on for like about eight years. I mean, it, it's been a long time. I was doing, you know, it wasn't sustained writing, but I would work through sections and then I would just put it away. And then I would come back to it a couple of years later. And that, that's been, but all of my books have been, they've been different in terms of um, sometimes I've done a draft of a book and then realize that there was something missing, put it aside for a little while, write something else, maybe even publish something else, then come back and go, oh, that's what this one needs. And so there's this kind of recursive process, but there's also this layering that goes on with it. I've, the, the, the only great thing I can say about that is that I don't worry about it anymore. Like it'll, it'll be what it is. And my work is to sort of just um, to follow these stories and to trust sometimes too that the story is more than I know at the moment. Like what what I am conscious of is just a piece. It's an important piece, but um, but it's one piece, and that there's something else going on that's bigger than 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 even me in that. And so um, yeah, it's okay that it takes a long time. It can get it can get kind of scary, but I trust that it's okay. Well, it's not particularly linear. Well, then there's the muse. Done a great job. <laughs> right. Ah, speaking of the muse, uh, someone asked, do you ever get writer's block and how do you overcome it? I think everybody gets writer's block. I think uh, for me personally, I, how I over, overcome when I'm stuck on a thing is I walk away from it for a little bit and just regroup. You know, sometimes you have to walk away. I'll go for a walk with my wife or go for a boat ride or something and come back and the, and the answer will be right there. But sometimes you just have to walk away. I love getting re-inspired. Travel does that for me or uh, since we've been safer at home, you know, walks in the neighborhood, um, things like that. But yeah, the muse grabs me in the morning. I mean, I wake up at 5.45 and it's almost like, okay, let's go. So I write before everybody gets up. Uh, we have two last questions before we wrap up, uh, one for Sherry and one for KG. So uh, Sherry, uh, is evangelical religion a through line in your books? And if so, why? You think? Yeah, it is. Well, it is a it is definitely a through line in my books because that's probably my biggest hang up in the world and it's how I grew up and I can't let it go. Um, so I, I have this, I just keep coming back to it. I do it over and over. I need to work on it. Um, I, you know, I am not my care. Well, I am in all of my characters and I am not, you know, them completely and what's happening to them isn't what's happening to me. But, um, but almost every book I've ever written, I've done some, um, you know, I, I, I've gone after hypocritical Christianity and mainly it's just because I was hurt by it. And so I reckon I'm not done yet. And when I am, maybe I'll have a new topic, but I, I keep catching it. I, I usually don't even see it so much. And then I've published something else and I'm like, Oh my God. Um, but what I can say is that, um, you know, I have been very fortunate, um, to, to have lived long enough now to have reached a very different relationship with some of the members of my family who are still involved in, you know, some of these, you know, religious beliefs that exclude me. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's in everything I do and, and it might be for a while more. 
Understandable. Uh, and for KG, uh, how long did it take you to reconnect uh, with the characters in this book after being away from them for so long? Well, these characters, I've spent a lot of time with them and they've never quite gone away. Um, the challenge this time around was to age them 10 years. Mm. Uh, the last time I left, they were in their 30s and now they're, uh, they're approaching 50. And the, the impish little boy is, isn't a little boy anymore. He's not a cute, cute little kid. He's, a, he's an obnoxious teenager. And uh, I shouldn't say obnoxious. He's a, he's a challenging teenager. Um, but I did, before I started um, the outline, I did read through the entire series mm -hmm. and I took notes um, for the things that, that I had, that were big in the earlier books. I knew I had to, to address them again. Um, for example, Lily's alcoholism, is she still not drinking? I have to, I have to address that in this book. Um, so when I, when I really got down to the brass tacks of writing though, I had to go back and read the entire series again for the flavor and the tone, because I did want it to be in that sense, a continuation. I wanted to make sure that these characters hadn't had a personality transplant over 10 years. So they had, they had grown, they'd grown significantly, their relationship had grown, but, um, but yeah, they're, they're old friends. So in terms of reconnecting with them, that I started there, I started with already knowing them quite well. That's beautiful. I look forward to having a relationship with a character like that someday. Uh, thank you all so much. This was a wonderful panel and thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. And now I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This was thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Kay. It was thank a lot of fun. Great comments and this is, this is wonderful. Thank you. And now I have to buy six new books. So thank you guys. <laughs> or seven even. I can't, can't, can't count. Oh, six. No, six go. Um, so I got to get keys in there too. So thank you to you guys. Thanks, Kay, for moderating. Thank you for our sponsor, Bella Books. Um, our next virtual series will be poetry. Um, so we will have um, Emily August, Lisa Baird, Sandra De Helen, Le Monique King, Leslie Newman, Ocean, Arm Choi Wild, and it'll be moderated by Elizabeth Hodge. So that's April 24th. Um, also a reminder to register for the conference in July. Um, and you still have time to submit some panels or, um, and or a panelist application that's due on March 31st. And hopefully you guys will um, you know, think about doing a panel. Um, and then um, April 1st, the author spot spotlights will come out. So that will be open for signups. It fills up very fast. Last year, I think it was like within a day it filled up. So um, if you wanna do author readings again for, um, for, for more people, April 1st is the date for that. So thank you, thank you all for this and spending some time here and look like everybody really enjoyed it. All right, so have a good evening or day or wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>